we are asking the question, once saved, always saved? Does the Bible teach that once you're saved, you're saved no matter what? We see examples in the media all the time of of celebrities and and, uh, politicians and even church leaders who are self-professed Christians, but they practice things in their lives that we know the Bible says are sinful. Is that right? And this is a question we can go to dozens, if not hundreds, of scriptures to discuss. Uh, but these are meant to be very short presentations to make you think. And, um, and so we'll go to only a few. And perhaps a good initial question might be what it means to be saved. And do we all agree on what that means? Saved from what? Well, in the Old Testament Bible, when we see the word saved, we know it's the Hebrew word Yahshua. And Joshua, we would pronounce it in, in uh, English. If you don't know, that's Jesus' actual name. Jesus is an uh, anglicized version of a Latinized version of a Hellenized version of Yahshua, which means God saves, literally. And the lexicon, the Hebrew lexicon, will tell you that the saved part of it means to deliver, to rescue, to protect. And in the New Testament, the Greek word there is sodizo, which also means to, to deliver, to rescue, or protect. So what is it that we all need to be rescued from? What is our common enemy as human beings? Well, of course, it's death. And if you're a believer, you know that it's sin and death. That's what we all have in common. We all die. We would rather not. We are prisoners to death. We are prisoners to sin and death. Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. So the question we're considering today is, is salvation, is being saved, something that happens to us once at a specific point in time and is then irreversible? Because that is how many Christians today uh, believe that it works. But what does the Bible say? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. This is the sort of scripture that might lead someone to believe that salvation comes at the moment when a person decides that they believe that Jesus is their Savior. You might have heard people talk about inviting Jesus into your heart. And then by extrapolation, the conclusion is, because I'm saved, because Jesus died for me, uh, I'm saved from here on because I believe in that. This might be a difficult point to counter if these were the only two verses that we have. But the Bible is a big book, and we need to make sure that our understanding of God's ways and principles are based on the entire book, the entire message, with no one part contradicting another. Let's talk about the mechanisms of salvation. What was it that Jesus did that saves people who believe? In Hebrews we read, therefore, since the children, meaning man, share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise partook of the same nature, that through death he might render powerless him or that which had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation or atonement for the sins of the people. What is that telling us? How did Jesus save? Well, what it's saying is that he rendered powerless sin, rendered sin powerless, because he had a sin-prone nature like you and I, and yet he never sinned. And so sin had no power over him. And therefore, he had not earned death, as the Bible tells us, death, uh, the wages of sin, is death. 
He did not deserve death. And yet, despite never sinning, he willingly laid his life down as a sacrifice for sin. And that sacrifice God accepted as an effective atonement for all who believe in his Son and in that saving power. Well, in Romans 6 we read, the death that Jesus died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Jesus chose both in his life and in his death not to live for sin. He chose to live for God. We see that in the temptation in the wilderness after his baptism, when the, the lust and the pride that dwells in all of us tried to talk him into using the Holy Spirit to feed himself and to fly and to take over the world, and he would not relent to those temptations. We see it in the Garden of Gethsemane right before his crucifixion when he says, Lord, take this cup from me, but yet, if possible, but yet not my will be done, your will be done. He chose all the time to live for God and not to live for himself. And so we like that phrase, dying to sin and living to God, because it's a scriptural phrase. So does the Bible teach us that because he did that, as long as I believe that he did that for me, then I'm free to do whatever I want. Is that what the Bible tells us? Well, Peter says, Jesus himself bore our sins in, the, in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. We are all supposed to die to sin and live to righteousness. Die to sin and live to God. In fact, Peter is saying here that that's the reason that Jesus gave his life. To set an example of the way to salvation. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he says. Follow me. This is the way. Die to sin and live to God. Should we continue in sin? In Romans 5, Paul has been talking about grace and how wonderful grace is, and absolutely it is. And uh, it's, a, it's a great blessing uh, for which we should all be thankful that God is gracious and merciful unto us. Paul then asks the question, you know, if we have, if Jesus has obtained forgiveness for us, and forgiveness is a wonderful blessing, then the more we sin, the more we're forgiven, right? That's, isn't that what we should do? And Paul indicates here that that's a, that's a silly question. May it never be. Should we continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Right? It's a silly question. Also in Romans 6, Even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And don't go, don't, don't go on presenting your members, the members of your body, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. It's pretty straightforward, really. It's foolishness to suggest that God gave His Son, God who hates sin, gave His Son for us so that we would be free to sin. May it never be. Reading from the Gospel of John and the 15th chapter, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. For you are already clean because of the world which I, uh, word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and in him, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up, 
And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, I will abide. You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. This is my, my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than he, he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. The unfruitful will be cut off, Scripture tells us. In Galatians chapter 5, we read this. The deeds of the flesh are evident, and they are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, and factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. There's nothing more that we can add to make this any clearer. The works of the flesh, sin, will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, you cannot live a life of sin. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury which will consume the adversaries. We can't make it much clearer than that. James in his epistle writes, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Religion isn't about what you believe. It's about what you do. James also says in the second chapter of his epistle, You, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the, of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him, as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Well, our community, the Christadelphians, are often accused of teaching salvation by works because of the things I've said to you in this short video today. Rest assured that none of us believe that we can earn salvation by the things that we do. Salvation is only by the grace of God and that not of ourselves. We all sin, and only because of the ongoing forgiveness of sins do we have hope. But we can't, in light of Scripture, claim to believe and then continue to live in sin. As we just read, faith without works is dead. As we read, if we're not producing the fruit of the Spirit, the good and virtuous things, we will be cut off as dead branches. 
Do you claim to have faith? If you truly do have faith, it will be proven by the works that you do. But if you or I truly love sin, that too will be proven out by the works that we do. In conclusion, Micah 6, verse 8, God has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Thanks for watching, and contact us at the address below if you'd like to talk some more about this or anything else related to the Bible.